Oncologists are now weighing the benefits of treating cancer patients against the risk of exposing them to the novel coronavirus. This is Blood and Cancer, the official podcast of MDH Hematology Oncology. I'm the voice of MDH Podcasts, Nick Andrews. And I'm joined this week, as I always am, by Dr. David Henry. And Dr. Henry, we're recording this a little later than we typically do because you had some uh, fatherly slash family duties to take care of. And it's one of those things that one can just not get out of ever. Well, what would be the best thing you could do while you're in the middle of an epidemic and social distancing and then have your daughter move into a new house Correct. this weekend? So my yes. wife was see everything just so, and she's moving in near us. Mm. So um, we're trying to go out there and do some put the filters in and get the lights on. And so helping right. things happen for this weekend. So it's never a dull moment. Yeah, no. And I, I must say that um, if, if, if you were moving and your friends told you, no, I can't help you. There's a pandemic. It's a really good way to get out of it. But if you are related to the person moving, you got to be there. You got to be there. Although we're, we're working out how we'll be there this weekend because we all have to stay away from each other and wear our masks. So Hope somebody takes pictures of this craziness. <laughs> Speaking of pictures, uh, we are available via video. We're going to try some things out on social media. And I see that you are at the command center of the Starship Enterprise. And how, how long have you been serving the commander? Well, I've, I've been in the uh, on the uh, service with the Federation for about 20 years now. <laughs> I actually had an experience before they did away with it in Las Vegas of actually going on the bridge of the, of the Enterprise. And while you're there, they say, uh, we're sorry to interrupt this uh, show, but there's been a crisis and we need your help. Yeah. And Will Riker comes on and of course, I jumped right in. We helped him out of the crisis. Yeah. Well, I, I couldn't be in better hands than as we, as we move forward to this podcast. It's an interesting interview this week. So let's talk about our guest. Our guest this week is Dr. David Kerr, who was with a university that most people have heard of the university of Oxford in England. And I must say the conversation was fascinating because you're comparing the differences between the way things are treated in the Eastern Hemisphere, particularly uh, Europe, and how things are treated in the Western Hemisphere. Well, it's most interesting. He's a really wonderful, well-known investigator, oncologist, in particular colorectal GI cancer. He's a former ESMO, European Society of Medical Oncology president, and just a really basic uh, down-to-earth practitioner. And so we talked about how we practice differently here and there in the best of times, and then, of course, in the worst of times now. I learned a couple of things from him with regard to adjuvant therapy we'll hear about and metastatic therapy. And one of the things we don't do much in the States, about um, 5% of people will have 5-FU uh, uh, capecitabine type toxicity. Mm. He said, well, aren't you aware? measuring the DPYD in the States? I said, well, um, maybe. And um, apparently not often enough because that can help uh, detect who might have that kind of toxicity. Mm. So we get into that as well as trying to now in COVID, trying to use as little intravenous therapy as possible and as much oral therapy as possible, particularly with capecitabine. And I, I must say that the, the conversation was really interesting when you, when you juxtapose those two things because you think that the disease is the same. And he gets into the way that different healthcare systems work. And I, I think it's a good thing to kind of look in the mirror a little bit and see how the other half lives. And I, I think that you know, avenues like podcasts and the internet are uh, a great way to do that. Now, you can see more about uh, Dr. Kerr by clicking the link in the show notes. You can also read articles that he has written at mdh.com slash hematology dash oncology. And as we always like to mention a little bit, we're, we're talking a lot about uh, COVID-19. And just a quick update, how's your, your mental health and, and how important is it to stay in, in touch with you people you're working with and you know, one week at a time as we're here at Blood and Cancer? Exactly. Each week at a time as things go by, um, I'm in Philadelphia in the shadow of New York, and so we think we're peaking now, and I, I think, uh, fortunately, New York has reached that and is coming down, although as the governor of New York says each day and each week on his uh, press conference, uh, you know, if it was 700, 600, 500, that's a good thing. Well, of course, it's not a good thing, but it's a less thing. Mm. Uh, we're very busy. I'm in the Penn system nearby us is Jefferson Temple. My son's actually a Jefferson GI doctor. Um, we're, we're having our surge now. The inputs and the outputs, admissions and discharges are about equal now. <clears throat> Very sick people. Interestingly, our emergency room, they'll hate me for saying this because I'll jinx them, have been slower 
because people don't want to go there right. unless they're really sick. And I think as we've talked about, the cardiologists are mystified. MIs are down by about a third. Where are they? Yes. Are they not happening because we're huh. not getting upset or we're not exercising as much. You're just staying home with a heart attack. So it's a curious observation. Yeah, that, that, that definitely is curious. So if you want to stay up to date with all of your COVID-19, particularly, no, we're not talking about case numbers or anything that you can find on the, the wonderful Johns Hopkins dashboard or, or CNN, it's particularly how it pertains to clinical treatment of hematology oncology in the era of COVID-19 and how things interplay. You can go to mdh.com slash hematology oncology. You'll find headlines like uh, how the European Cancer Centers restructure care in the era of COVID-19, uh, why prioritize lung cancer patients during COVID-19, especially during testing. Um, all things like that can be found on our website. So let's preview what's coming down the pike. We Discussed that we might do part two of a conversation on apps this week, but that's going to be bumped a little bit. And we're going to bring back one of our favorite guests as we head toward the summer. Every year we want to talk to Dr. Skip Burris, and that's coming down the pike as well. Well, that was uh, really to tease our audience to please tune in a week from now. <laughs> After you hear Dr. Kerr on this podcast, um, I had the opportunity to interview a, a very good friend and a, a wonderful investigator and leader. Dr. Skip Burris, who is this year's ASCO president, I began by asking him, how many Advils have you taken? And he <laughs> said he's beyond counting. Although he said that as upsetting as the whole thing was and to make the ASCO meeting go entirely virtual, it presented some interesting challenges and solutions and probably some things that will happen after this meeting will hang on. Uh, for our listeners, he'll describe how the educational sessions won't happen until late in summer. All of the abstracts that are going to come out in, in mid-May when the abstracts are uh, listed online will be presented in real time. You can ask questions. I said, uh, how about my poster? Do I have to show it in my living room to my family? He said, no. Your poster and everybody else's poster will be shown in real time. With uh, You can walk up and down the aisles and look at posters, including poster discussions. So it was a really interesting interview, and that'll come out next week. Yep, and you can find that by uh, subscribing wherever podcasts are found, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora. And we love those five-star reviews. We take them seriously. And we have made alterations to Blood and Cancer and other shows at MD Edge based on reviews and emails. You can email us at podcasts at mdedge.com. Of course, you can follow Dr. David Henry on Twitter, and you can follow MD Edge Hematology Oncology on Twitter. Those links as always, available in the show notes. I wanted to make a quick announcement about Dr. Alana Yerkowitz. She's doing well. Uh, we are in touch with her. She will be hopefully back uh, one of these days coming up soon. But in the interim, we're going to be republishing uh, old, I guess, iterations of Clinical Correlation, which is her segment. She's been doing it for dozens and dozens of episodes now. So we're going to try to bring them back next week. Uh, maybe like pick the clinical correlation that relates the, to the, the best, episode. Best of. Yes. Yeah, I, I look forward to that. She has such a wonderful style and picks such one interesting topics and does such a good job. I can't wait to see them come back again uh, while she's busy taking care of the front lines in, uh, at Stanford. We'll hear some of her best of, Ilana. Absolutely. Davis. So Dr. David Henry and Dr. David Kerr are coming up with their conversation right after this. I'm Dr. David Henry, your host, listening today to our podcast entitled Blood and Cancer, which airs every Thursday morning on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast from. And you can also find us on our web page of our electronic journal at mdedge.com slash hematology-oncology. And I'm delighted to be talking today, not in the U.S., but in the U.K. So we're going to hear a lot of how things are different across the Atlantic with Dr. David Kerr, who's professor of cancer medicine at the University of Oxford Dr. Kerr, Professor Kerr, thank you so much for joining us. Lovely, lovely to speak to you, but insist that you call me David rather than anything more formal. Well, since I'm the same, we'll, uh, we'll be David squared. <laughs> Good. So um, today, uh, David is a colorectal cancer specialist, and I wanted to take the opportunity not only to click through how you're treating colorectal cancer, adjuvant and metastatic in the COVID era, but of course, how you're handling treating patients, telehealth, and so forth. We'll get into that in just a minute. So to tell our listeners that what we're going to click through now is actually a beautiful piece that David did on the MD Edge webpage. 
entitled Colorectal Cancer Proposed Treatment Guidelines for the COVID-19 Era. So we're all trying to treat our patients best we can, but not have them visit us too often and or get toxicity to, to come in. So to keep them away from us and us away from them. And so there's a, on that particular piece that you did last week for our listeners, there's a lovely chart entitled Recommendations for Adjuvant Therapy in Stage 2 slash 3 Colorectal Cancers. So I thought we'd start with Stage 2, and you broke it down into under 70 and fit, over 70 or under 70 with some comorbid, or over 70 and significant comorbid. So why don't we just say, for the sake of argument, um, hopefully most of us will have patients under 70 and fit in Stage 2. And I think of, I'm a general hematologist oncologist. I always look to the super specialists like you for advice. Um, you probably know uh, Dan Haller, a mentor of mine at Penn. Um, hope he's not listening. I don't, I don't misspeak anything. <laughs> so I, I, I think of stage two often as not treat unless X, Y, Z. So what typically pushes you to treat a stage two colorectal cancer adjuvant therapy? It's an interesting one. And I think there are some subtle differences when we compare our practice of cancer medicine on this one with the US and UK. So, so Dan is a very particular friend of mine. He and I are co-editing the Oxford Textbook of Oncology just now. So I think both of us, David Square, will have to, to, to mind our P's and Q's here. Uh, we did, uh, so um, adjuvant treatment is a big thing of ours. Um, my wife and I, the, so I, I, my identity has been subsumed into being the CARES. There are two of us around our clinic. There's me, old, likable Scottish professor care. And I sort of, I've got to say, slightly less likable Yorkshire Professor Rachel Kerr. Um, so we, um, ha I guess, have guided the practice of adjuvant chemotherapy in the UK, Europe, rest of the world, for almost two decades, really. And our Quasar trial, our Quasar trials group, Quasar is the acronym for Quick and Simple and Reliable, was the first to show in the Lancet some time ago that there was indeed a survival benefit for offering adjuvant chemotherapy to stage two patients. The, the benefit was modest. It was around about a 4% survival improvement. Um, and I feel that's enough of a benefit for us to at least offer adjuvant chemotherapy to those patients who are under 70 and who are fit. So it's a discussion that we have. And in our hands, what we find is about Maybe 60% of the younger patients are keen to go ahead with adjuvant treatment, even with that, you know, that very modest 4% absolute improvement in survival. Older patients tend to say no. They, they look at the benefits and disbenefits and, 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 and sort of more often say no. But I think it's legitimate, intellectually reasonable to have the discussion and to pose the pros and cons and to work with the patient to make a decision with them. We know that our colleagues in breast cancer um, can offer adjuvant chemotherapy for much smaller survival benefit. I, I was just thinking the same thing. They go down to about 2%, yes. Ah, exactly so. And the, ma the majority of our patients in the Quasar trial, we had about 3,000 patients in it. So um, that, that was a reliable part. So when we talk about Quasar, Reliability comes from large numbers, tight confidence intervals, um, I think re reliable interpretation. Um, and the majority of our patients, 70, 75%, were T3N knots with no bells or whistles or high risk factors or any of the rest of it. And I, I, I've got a, a wee bit of a max to grind about using pathological um, markers of um, high risk in stage two. Um, um, when, when the pathology community has looked at its capacity to identify patients with vascular invasion, lymphatic invasion, and um, arguments over the degree of differentiation grade, the degree of correlation between different pathology centers can be as low as 50%, i.e. Really? tossing a point. Aye. Um, it, it, so it gets down to that sort of level. So although we sort of think that these risk factors are carved in stone, they're often more subjective than objective. Uh, and therefore, I tend not to be too swayed by them. And that's why we've got a big research group looking at more objective molecular and other markers to define those truly at high risk. Well, that pushes me to maybe ask you about uh, 
in breast cancer, we do the Oncotype DX all the time. And there mm. exists one in colon cancer, to your point about molecular. Has that become ready for us to use or not yet? Interesting question. And again, our, our group, our Quasar group, helped to validate. Again, it's a very nice cooperation between the US and UK uh, with our friends in NSABP. And um, we, we validated the Oncotype DX for colon cancer. Lovely piece of science, um, very impressive uh, company, Genomic Health, with their RT-PCR work. The problem is that the, 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 risk, the risk factors um, associated with the oncotype um, assay uh, for colon is not as strong as for breast. And although it is used and although it's a validated discriminant, it's perhaps that the, the hazard ratios are relatively small, uh, 1.5, 1.6. Mm -hmm. Whereas with some of the more recent work, particularly looking at digital pathology and AI, hazard ratios are up to three and four. Much stronger discriminants are out there. So it hasn't quite taken off in the way that the breast one did. Um, and, and there may be some new digital pathology AI markers that are a bit more powerful. Well, I think that's certainly something for us to look forward to because yeah, the molecular seems to trump clinical subjective evaluation uh, more and more. And I one in my list of things to mention here, I think if you saw less than 12 lymph nodes or perforation, that might push you more um, to offer this patient adjuvant therapy, true? So, so true for the first one. These days, less so for the second. I, I mean, okay. I think in the last decade, maybe longer, has seen a remarkable global improvement in the quality both of surgery, but the quality and uniformity of pathology uh, reporting. So it's dead unusual now for you know anybody in a you know in a significant cancer hospital to see a path report that's got less than twelve nodes. Yes, now, right. I, I do a lot of work in low and middle income countries, and it's a struggle and it's different there. But I, I think that message is, I, I think we're past that hump now. And although it is a recognized prognostic factor, agreed entirely, it, doesn't, it just doesn't count as much now. All right, so we have the stage two, we've just discussed T3, T4, N0. And now let's talk in the COVID era, you've decided and talk with the patient and he or she agrees. What are you giving and for how long? We, we, we use a lot of oral capsitabine. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in original Quasar studies, um, placebo-controlled and so on, uh, we're using bolus 5 If you, I go far enough back as an oncologist, I'm about 120 years old. To I the think day. I might go back further, but just go. <laughs> <clears throat> so I'm using push and bolus 5 fu with uh, leucovorin. And when the exact studies came out comparing capsitabine with what we called in those days a Mayo Clinic regime, um, the, the capsitabine came out very nicely and it's a much more cost-effective way for us to deliver the drug. It keeps patients out of the, out of the hospital facility. Um, and it's not, I mean, it's, it's not a trivial drug. I mean, we still need to watch over patients and so on, but it, it sort of met our, uh, what we wanted to do was to try and reduce the comorbidity of chemotherapy in the time of COVID but also to reduce the burden um, of delivering chemotherapy on our chemotherapy frontline staff and um, to keep patients as far as we could out of hospital to protect our senior oncology nurses and to reduce the fiddling around with infusional pumps and so on. Sure. Nurses. You know, you know, just the hassle factor to take it down as low as we could. So we, we, use, we use six months of Cape to be in a conventional dose. Um, two weeks on, one week off, as was reported in the exact study. And we, we're pretty happy with that. So I was intrigued by some of your, your writing recently and this much we noticed that's uh, posted last week, measuring enzyme to see if there's uh, fluoroprimidine toxicity. Do you check that on your capecitabine patients and what are you checking? We, we do, David. We, we do that in Oxford, increasingly in the UK. We do that in all our patients receiving fluoroprimidine treatment. We know that 5-FU, which is actually one of the most widely used anti-cancer drugs in the world, yeah. is, is broken down and degraded by an enzyme called dihydropyrimidine dehydrogenase, DYPD. 
And if there are genetic variants in that that reduce the activity of the enzyme, then consequently you get higher than average um, levels of 5-FU in the bloodstream. And in some cases, with some of these genetic variants so high that it's associated at almost 100% with the risk of death. So we, we run these genetic screen in all our patients, identifying rarely, but importantly, patients whom if we gave them 5-FU would die, or patients who are at a high risk of grade four toxicity, particularly neutropenia, um, septic, um, neutropenic fever, grade four hematology drops and so on. And, and we found in the six months since we instituted this, quite, quite a significant reduction in the number of patients being admitted to our wards because of fluoropyrimidine toxicity. So quite, quite a nice wee thing. And it's, it's, a, it's a test that we helped to invent. You know, we've got a fantastic genetics outfit in Oxford and we, you know, we've done quite a bit of work in improving the um, sensitivity specificity of the test. Well, and um, I always think of, uh, to switch to another drug we're not going to talk about, around TCAN and Gilbert's disease, and those patients don't metabolize that drug very well. That's, this is a different enzyme system than Gilbert's? It is, but, but you're exactly right to mention it's, it's, it's encompassed within the whole field of pharmacogenetics. In that if we can understand what the genetic variants are that may, re, that may cause somebody to either um, over-metabolize or under-metabolize a drug, um, it would allow us to individualize those. I, I don't know what you're feeling about precision medicine is. Uh, precision medicine has been taken over by the molecular biologist, yeah. and that, we, we like that. But, but you and I both know, you know, be, being sort of gray beards, that the, the, the thing that you and I control most about the delivery of any drug to any patient is its dose and schedule. And that will be determined by a host of other factors. And if we can individualize the dose, I, I think we overdose patients, but I also think we underdose them. And if we could control dose and individualize that better, that's got to be an important component of precision. And that sounds old fashioned, doesn't it? But no, I, still think, I think it's certainly a step in the right direction. Why not? Because, you know, sadly, I've given capecitamine to patients and uh, one or two times had someone admitted for weeks with diarrhea that wouldn't stop tremendous toxicity uh, by proper meter squared dosing and then others who don't turn a hair, so to speak. So I think if we could more, we're supposed to be precision, ASCO and ESMO. Um, tell us to. I think it's a great idea. I wanted to mention um, a bit at Penn to keep people out of uh, hospital and clinic or suggesting Cape Cytid be an alternate week. Would you be a fan of that? Or are you like testing the enzyme and doing the two weeks on, one week off? We, that's interesting. We, we've just stuck with this. I think it's a clever idea. Um, and, it, and I think it would reduce patterns of toxicity. So we've, we've gone with the enzyme um, because we're, we're pretty comfortable with it. Mm. And, you know, we've Quite strong, you know, quite strong, um, quite strong underpinning signs, but but also being prepared to dose reduce in over seventies. Um, uh, again, we know that in older people, in terms of, you know, function, you know, just the old clinic clinical pharmacology isn't really taught anymore. It's all we all drop down into canonical pathways and ends, you know, all that stuff. Yes, pathways. Yes. <laughs> this is this sounds like two old fogies now, but we are not. We are cutting edge precision oncologists. But in terms of clinical pharmacology, you know, old folk, we we tend to be a wee bit gentler with the chemotherapy anyway. Mm -hmm. Maybe offering eighty percent of the conventional dose up front, exactly for for sensible reasons. I'm sure you're the same. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, then let's move on to stage threes. So here we're thinking T3N1 or greater like T4N1 and 2. And of course, I believe it was Dan Sargent who sadly left us uh, the IDEA trial, putting this all together to say, I remember the ASCO maybe two years ago where um, this was presented and gee, we don't need to give six months. And these were talking about KPOX or Folfox versus three months. So now maybe if you'd mention how you're handling now in the COVID era, your T3N1s, and what are you giving them? No, th thanks, David. Um, I, I think there is very good data from, from the US, from the SEER endpoint data, from our own. We, we've now recruited 12, 15,000 patients to adjuvant trials, and, and we are part of the um, ideal group that, that Dan led so honorably and so well for so long. 
So there's a big international consensus about pulling our data together. And I think the T3 N1s do as well as the stage twos. So we wouldn't be inclined to offer them anything different. I don't think there's any role for the use of Axella patent in the treatment of stage two disease. And my great friend, Amy de Gramon has, has proven that. Mm -hmm. And if we think that the clinical outcomes, the natural history, the survival patterns are similar for T3N1, as has been shown repeatedly in, in large community studies, we, we treat them in the same way. Now, wouldn't it be lovely just to give three months capsitabine? Yeah. And, um, my, my sort of tricky wife would be prepared to consider that. Um, I, I can see that because you, you just... You must have fascinating dinner table conversations. No, we do. She just walked past the kitchen and glared, <laughs> and glared at me. So it's <laughs> life. Um, yeah. But we, that feels a step too far just now. You know, that all, we try to base everything in published evidence. And I think six months Cape Cytobine, as we discussed, feel, feels fine to me. Um, you're, you're right. I mean, Rachel was part of the Scott trial, which contributed to that lovely New England publication uh, last year, mm -hmm. um, in which uh, there is good evidence that three months is as good as six months. Now, we would, we would quite often split hairs. And if we were seeing patients with T4, N2 disease in normal circumstances, um, we would quite often offer six months treatment rather than three, splitting yeah. hairs a little. But in the time of COVID, we just couldn't, we just, we wouldn't do it. We wouldn't you do, do it. do three months. Yeah. Aye. And I think you were persuaded, or I should ask you, are you persuaded? I remember the idea trial, and it's been presented a couple of times, and you, of course, and Mrs. Dr. Kerr participated. Uh, <laughs> the... Um, Folfox was beat out by the K-Pox. Um, does that resonate with you as well? I, I, I think, so I, you know, we, we cannot uh, work in Oxford and not be terrified of Sir Richard Peto, who is the enemy of all subgroup analyses and so on. You know, Richard right. Right. beats right. us over the head dreadfully. Um, so I, I, I think there's a, there's a huge statistical instability in subgroup analysis, and it would be sort of surprising that KPOX is better than full faults because if you look at the data overall, they're, they're indistinguishable. If anything, the needle slightly favours full faults. So in, the, in this particular case, the needle went the other way, and I think, you know, I, I didn't pay too much attention to you it. You think statistically too close to call? Very interesting. And and in COVID, three months KPOX for reasons of no infusion, um, outpatient, etc. Ex exactly, exactly so. So reducing hassle. And, and just making life that bit safer, that bit easier, we'd hope, for, for our patients, but also for our frontline chemotherapy staff, um, you know, being as protective as we can be of them too. Well, that makes a lot of sense to me. Let's move then on to advanced colorectal cancer. And I'm now looking at these lovely bullet points from your publication last week, and it's titled Recommendations for Advanced Colorectal. And the, the main headers are which regimen, treatment breaks, deferring the start of chemotherapy, and chemotherapy after a section of metastases. So maybe a few words about each. So you have a, perhaps a synchronous presentation. I had a patient just a couple of weeks ago with sigmoid colon cancer with a very couple large metastases in liver. And we began her on Cape Cytobine oxaliplatin. Is that the regimen you're suggesting? It, it is, David. We, we'd, we'd go with that. I mean, that's just our sort of default backbone chemotherapy. So we, we would do exactly the same as you. Exactly with so. bevacizumab now or not, uh, with or without COVID era? So we, we don't use bevacizumab. Uh, again, this is a, a stark difference, I'd say, between our two healthcare systems. I used to be quite strongly involved in governmental health policy around cancer planning, etc. And our NICE, our National Institute for Clinical Excellence, decided early on that the clinical benefits accrued by bevacizumab were too small to warrant its, at that stage, enormous cost. So we just don't use bevacizumab at all. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? I, and I think it's very interesting because we're looking at the same data and across the Atlantic, we, we practice differently. Um, I, I can't disagree with you. I've, I've been underwhelmed with the difference yet we and our patients say, you know, what's the most you could possibly give to me? Well, of course, then we start clicking off the bevacizumab and sync the national health care budget. Um, it's, it's, for, it's, for those isn't it fascinating? It's fascinating. 
So when we go way back to Herb Herbert's initial data, um, you know, using bolus, 5 f urinotecan and so on, a, a, a rather unusual bolus regime that's just not widely used at all, but showing a very significant benefit for bevacizumab. And I suspect the bevacizumab was making up the gap for a somewhat inferior chemotherapy regime. Yeah. The big trials, 2,000 patient studies looking at KPOX or FOLFOX plus or minus bevacizumab, the benefits almost disappeared, almost. Some improvements in progression-free survival, but nothing seen in overall survival at all. And therefore, in our taxation-based healthcare system, yeah. it was actually quite an easy decision to say, sorry, we, we need to pass on this one. Well, that's very, very well reasoned. And how about the next bullet here, treatment breaks. So you've gotten three months in, there's CEA falling, lesions are smaller. Do you press on or give a break? So we, we've done two large trials in the United Kingdom, um, both published in The Lancet, in which we took patients who were responding to chemotherapy and those patients who were responding after three months, we randomized them to stop and start or continuous chemotherapy. And there was no difference in overall survival in either of those groups. Now, this was, these are quite old trials with somewhat inferior chemotherapy. But nevertheless, it gave us an intellectual basis for offering chemotherapy holidays. It's a nice way to present it to patients. And, and what, what we do is if patients have got relatively small volume disease, relatively ill, indolent, asymptomatic, we would give them a, a, a couple of months, we'd give them a holiday break, um, then scan again. And if there's any sense of progression at starting, we'd restart the chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. If patients present with, with large volume disease that we know as soon as we stop the chemotherapy, we'll lose control, we'd probably move from KPOX um, to a single agent capsitabine with the same regime, doing the scan again in a couple of months. We didn't. We haven't talked about EGFR receptor inhibitors, yes. um, but if, if patients were on uh, one or other of those, then we would keep that going. We'd keep the biologic going, probably with single agent capsitabine uh -huh. dose reduced. Yeah, and, and drop the XLA. Okay, exactly. All Just right. Then, then a very interesting. Uh, the third of four bullets, deferring the start of any chemotherapy. So my my patient a couple of weeks ago has a sigmoid primary, not obstructed, not in pain, not bleeding, and a couple of liver lesions, and I can feel them, and they're a bit tender. Can I defer her? Uh, what's your threshold for deferring start of chemotherapy and metastatic disease? <laughs> you you present interesting cases with with that patient. I I think with your patient, I, I think I'd want to do something mm -hmm. that that feels intuitively right. Um, but see see we have somebody they've had their primary out, so we're not worried about any obstructive problems, and they come with a couple of small liver mets or a couple of small pulmonary metastases. Um, I think watching those for a couple of months um, um, just to sort of see what happened, if they're elderly, if they're a bit frail, if they're comorbid, that there's very little trial evidence to suggest when you and I should start chemotherapy. When, when I was a young kid, there were two trials that I, that, that I knew of, one Italian, one um, Northern European, both very small, uh, each of them recruiting only about 120 patients. And, and the idea was you observe and you give chemotherapy and the patients become symptomatic um, or you give chemotherapy straight away and randomized to one or the other management plan. And one trial was positive for early intervention. The other trial was negative. So very small, difficult trials to run. And I think you and I suffer from, a, we suffer from two things. We suffer from a lack of clear trial information, yeah. and we suffer from a lack of biological markers that allow you and I to be able to say to the patient sitting in our consulting room, don't worry, we think you've got indolent disease, therefore we can wait. And we think you've got indolent disease because <clears throat> we've done a fancy test. Yeah. Or, uh oh you know. Or, or the other way around. Play. Small volume in the scans, but it's nasty, so let's not dilly-dally and go on with it. And again, these are these are things that that we and many other labs around the world are looking at. Can we can we get a marker for for aggressiveness? Something like would that, wouldn't that be a handy thing to have? It would be. And again, back to precision medicine, we we need more markers. 
So to, to finish this list of yours on recommendations for advanced colorectal cancer, the final one of four, chemotherapy after a section of metastases, and I believe some of this data is always pointed to you've given pre-op, so-called neoadjuvant, the metastases have shrunk, uh, hopefully not disappeared for that poor surgeon to find them, and they've been resected. And those patients who got post-op, quote, adjuvant, um, always did a little better than those who didn't, but um, would you hold that or would you give it in the COVID era? We, we wouldn't recommend it. I think the whole literature around both neoadjuvant and you know, classically post-resection adjuvant chemotherapy is, is difficult. Um, it's an area that we've contributed to in the past. It's an area which is littered with small trials um, some sing, almost single center. Some great results from Nancy Kemeny and Memorial and intrahepatic arterial work and so on, mm -hmm. which has been, I mean, they're, they're a fantastic outfit. Nancy, a great friend, you know, superb um, clinical trialist, but difficult to take their expertise and take that to other centers, um, even Penn, even Oxford. Yeah. Um, but, so it's a rather confused area, and, and you know, given how things are just now, if I have a degree of confusion about benefits in the time of COVID, we, we don't feel it's worthwhile considering. Well, very good, and I, my last point I wanted to uh, ask is in rectal cancer, of course, there's radiation involved. And we've been persuaded a lot by data on this side of the world of the, the TNT, the total neoadjuvant therapy, which I've always been a fan of in, in all of my oncology career. Breast cancer, you can see if it's working or not. The patient can see it. You can see it. And here you can do the same thing and probably get more drug in as opposed to waiting for some pre-op, then op, then post-op. So I guess two-part question. Are you, are you a fan of the, the total neoadjuvant therapy? And are you curtailing somewhat the radiation piece in the COVID era? I think we're, we're becoming fans of the total neoadjuvant therapy. I think, I think it's taking a bit longer to um, be taken up across the UK, but the data look, look good. You, know, I, you and I are agreeing about that. But as things stand just now, we're trying to curtail everything. And we're going from complex um, radiochemotherapeutic regimes you know, from the, the, the long course type treatment to short course, we're looking to omit some of the drugs, for example, taking up saloplatin out yeah. rather than giving combination chemo radiotherapy. So, so our colleagues in the radiation field, again, are looking to compress and simplify um, as, as best they can and as logically as they can. Well, I think we've covered an awful lot, and I've taken a lot of your dinner time uh, to talk uh, about colorectal cancer, and you've been such a pleasure to, to talk with and answer a lot of my questions, and I uh, em embarrass you by saying how immodest you are, former president of ESMO, the European Society of Medical Oncology. Sadly, our ASCO is not going to occur this year in person uh, in end of May and June, and I think, unfortunately, ESMO is having the same sort of problems, and of course, you've done, as you mentioned earlier, in passing, you've done a lot of work with colorectal cancer around the world. So speaking as a, as a user of everything you give us tools to use, I really thank you very much and want to remind our listeners, you've been listening to Professor David Kerr, Professor of Cancer Medicine, University of Oxford, who's joined us today on our Blood and Cancer podcast, where you can find us on mdh.com slash hematology-oncology, where we'll have some show notes, uh, bullet points of what we discussed today, and reminding you that uh, Professor Kerr also had a nice discussion of this on the MD Edge Hematology Oncology webpage published last week. And so, David, I'd like to thank you so much. And I, I note in passing that I think you're one of the few people who was interviewed by his daughter um, or several, or maybe one year ago when she was eight years old. How did that go? It was, it was fantastic. Um, she asked the oddest questions of all time. And funnily enough, she was in today saying she hasn't yet been paid for appearing. <laughs> $150. You couldn't make it up. It was a true thought. <laughs> well, that's a wonderful note to end on. And again, I thank you very much. And I thank all our listeners for listening to Blood and Cancer. And we hope to have you join us next week. Thank you, David. Thanks very much, David.